tonight unclaimed and unburied. Dead bodies piling up in freezers at the back of a Newfoundland hospital. A morbid reflection of tough economic times. It's disturbing. As families struggle to cover funeral costs. It didn't give me a chance to mourn. I have no regrets. Exiting from the race and setting the stage for a U.S. presidential rematch. Also, a guilty verdict for the weapons handler on the deadly Rust movie set. Her own negligence. Plus, uncertainty over Ottawa's future funding to a U.N. relief agency in Gaza. And delivering against the odds. I'm so happy and grateful. Feeling blessed. Leaping forward with four times the joy. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Good evening, everyone. We begin tonight with the heartbreaking consequences of the cost of living in this country. For some, even burying a loved one has turned into a luxury. In Newfoundland, the number of cadavers in storage containers is mounting as families grieve their losses and also their desperate desire for a dignified final farewell. Here's CTV's Garrett Berry. Jerry Rice was like a father to his granddaughter, Samantha. So I used to go to every job with him when I was a little kid and be like helping. He was a great grandparent, funny, loving, until the very end. Even to the last day when he was getting ready to leave us. And I look at him crying and upset. He'd get mad at me because I'm upset. A man like that deserved a grand send off. But upon his death, they faced an $8,000 bill that had to be paid in full before the funeral home would take over from the long-term care home where he died. They weren't going to move my grandfather until he had the money. They leaned on family and friends for help. Three days later, they had the money together, but it was too late. The funeral home told Samantha her grandfather's body had deteriorated too much to hold a week, so they proceeded with a cremation. My grandfather was in a chilled room in the basement. There was no morgue. He was in a chilled room. To me, that's just, you're in the basement with no heat up. If not for that charity, their loved one may have ended up here. Tucked beside a garbage bin in a receiving bay, this is overflow for the morgue at the biggest hospital in St. John's. Health officials say it's a temporary temperature-controlled storage unit for what they call long-term unclaimed individuals. Opposition leaders in Newfoundland and Labrador say many people just can't afford funerals. The problem has gotten so big that health officials are planning to build a permanent storage unit for these remains on hospital grounds. It's disturbing, there's no question. Um, and it's certainly not the way we'd like to see um, the bodies of individuals um, uh, stored or, or preserved. Health officials won't say how many bodies are in that temporary storage unit tonight, but they do plan to start construction on the permanent unit in the coming months. Omar? Just devastating. All right, Garrett, thank you. One of the two Michaels jailed in China for years has reportedly reached a settlement with the federal government. A source tells the Globe and Mail Ottawa settled with Michael Spavor for about $6 million. It's not known if Michael Kovrig was also compensated. Both men were detained and accused of spying shortly after a Chinese telecom executive was arrested in Vancouver. The Bank of Canada held its key interest rate today, leaving it unchanged at 5%. The assessment of the Governing Council is that we need to give higher interest rates more time to do their work. Inflation has lowered, but still above the bank's 2% target. The next rate decision is on April 10th. And typically impacting Canada's economy is what happens in the United States. Donald Trump and Joe Biden easily dominated Super Tuesday, unofficially setting up a presidential rematch. The last time that happened was 70 years ago. With Nikki Haley exiting the race today, there is now a new battle tonight for her supporters. Here's CTV's Washington Bureau Chief Joy Melvin. It's game on Joe Biden versus Donald Trump 
again. After Nikki Haley, the last Republican candidate standing, bowed out of the presidential race. I said I wanted Americans to have their voices heard. I have done that. I have no regrets. Cobbling together a sizable coalition of never-Trumpers and independents, Haley congratulated Trump but didn't endorse him. It is now up to Donald Trump to earn the votes of those in our party and beyond it who did not support him. But unity will have to wait. While Haley was on stage, Trump lashed out at his rival, posting this. Nikki Haley got trounced last night in record-setting fashion, calling her supporters left-wing radicals, but invited them to come over to his MAGA movement. Trump will need them against Joe Biden. In a statement, the president praised Haley's courage for speaking the truth about Trump and making a play for her supporters, saying, you don't have to agree with me on everything to know MAGA extremism is a threat to this country. Trump racking up an endorsement from Mitch McConnell. They haven't spoken in years since the January 6th Capitol attack, when the Senate minority leader publicly blamed him. And I said in February of 2021, shortly after the attack on the Capitol, that I would support President Trump if he were the nominee of our party, and he obviously is going to be the nominee of our party. With the rematch officially on, Haley's supporters feel lost. I don't want to vote for him again, and I don't want to vote for Joe Biden. Right now, it's kind of, I feel homeless. There's plenty of other people who are earlier in their careers who could run and do a better job than those two. In his State of the Union speech Thursday night, the president will seize the moment in prime time to lay out his accomplishments with an eye towards the election. He'll have to show Americans he's up to the job for another four years. Omar? All right, Joy, thanks. There is a verdict tonight in the trial of the weapons handler who loaded Alec Baldwin's gun in the fatal shooting on the Rust movie set. Hannah Gutierrez-Reed has been found guilty of involuntary manslaughter, but not guilty of tampering with evidence. She faces up to 18 months in prison. Alec Baldwin's criminal trial begins in July. He has pleaded not guilty. Tense moments today for the president of Ukraine and a visiting foreign leader. A missile from a Russian airstrike on the port city of Odessa came down several hundred meters from where Volodymyr Zelensky was meeting with the Prime Minister of Greece. Neither was harmed, but at least five people were killed in the blast. Ottawa has suspended the largest contractor that worked on the Arrive Can app from bidding on any government contracts with security requirements. It's the third firm to receive some kind of punishment in this scandal. Last month, the Auditor General said Canadians paid too much for the app. CTV's Michael Couture joins us now. And, Mike, we got some more information today about costs. Omar, on the same day that two firms connected to the Arrive Can app were restricted from future bids on government contracts, we're learning more about just how much successive governments have used GC strategies. That's the firm at the heart of the controversial app. I can confirm that between January 1st, 2011, in February 16, 2024, departments reported that there have been 118 contracts with that supplier, totaling $107.7 million. The Comptroller General of Canada says he asked for a full accounting of contracts handed out to GC Strategies, Dalian and Coradix. The three companies linked to the Arrive Can app have been suspended from bidding on federal contracts. Wednesday, Public Services and Procurement Canada issued stop work orders to Coradix. That company shares office space in downtown Ottawa with Dalian, which, as you'll remember, is headed up by an employee at the Department of National Defence. All of this comes after that scathing Auditor General report on the app, which raised red flags about how the government awards contracts. The Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Procurement says... It's part of the government's efforts to get to the bottom of this. We want to make certain that those that are contracted are actually the ones creating uh, the work. And they can subcontract, certainly, uh, as long as they're providing uh, work orders and they're getting paid for work done. That will continue to be the focus on Thursday, when yet another parliamentary committee will be grilling public servants about the Arrive Can app. Omar. All right, Mike, thank you. We have stunning video of the moment an Air Canada flight was struck by lightning. The 777 was taking off from Vancouver Airport when the bolt hit. It looks scary, but 
Airliners are built to withstand lightning strikes. The plane continued on to London, where it landed safely. And here's some more shocking video out of B.C. tonight. A man barely escaping the path of an oncoming train. His motorhome was stalled on the tracks when the freight train plowed into it. A closer look shows the man getting out, frantically waving his hands before getting out of the way. The crossing was closed for cleanup, but everyone is okay. The federal government says it's open to changing the Emergencies Act, which it invoked two years ago during the Freedom Convoy protests. A commission of inquiry that followed urged Ottawa to review key provisions, but it wants more time to consult. The hindsight provided by the Commission's work, as well as the work undertaken by the Government of Canada and parliamentarians, offers us a critical outlook on potential changes that could be brought to the Emergencies Act. The Commissioner found widespread failures, but ultimately determined the Prime Minister was justified in invoking the Act. But in January, the federal court ruled using it was not reasonable. The government has appealed. A campaign to reduce emergencies from gender-based violence is gaining traction in Canada, and there is a desperate need. More than four in ten women have experienced some form of intimate partner violence in their lifetimes, and about a third, 15 years and older, say they've been sexually assaulted at least once. First launched in the UK, the program offers women at risk a discreet way to ask for help with a potentially life-saving question. CTV's Heather Wright explains. Actually, I was wondering if Angela was available today. Yes, absolutely. The woman in this handout video isn't looking for an actual person. Angela is a code word for help. The goal is to help survivors of gender-based violence who might not be able to access help in a, you know, a typical fashion. Victim Services Toronto has rolled out Ask for Angela, a way for people to seek help in a discreet and trauma-informed way. Angela? Yeah, absolutely. Right this way. They have partnered with Loblaws, Shoppers Drug Mart and affiliated stores where staff have been trained in what to do if someone asks for Angela. So we actually asked survivors themselves, where are you allowed to go during the day? Are you like where you're not being followed, where you're alone, um, where there's no suspicion of you seeking help? And they told us the pharmacy, uh, the grocery store. Hi, can I see Angela? Yes, of course. Ask for Angela first began in the United Kingdom in 2016, started by a police officer whose best friend, Angela Crompton, was killed by her husband, who beat her with a hammer. It began there in bars and restaurants as a way to alert staff to sexual assault, trafficking, or generally uncomfortable behavior. Ask for Angela isn't just um, a secret word. Ivana Kosak is the UK director of the Ask for Angela campaign where training has expanded to include how to spot someone who may be in danger. It's about giving people and customers that come into our venues the, not the relief, but basically that understanding that the venue that they're in is trained on how to spot people who are vulnerable. This campaign has been implemented in different venues around the world, but for it to work, advocates say awareness is key. People need to know how to ask for help and those being asked need to know what Angela means. Omar. All right, Heather, thank you. The Canadian press is reporting tonight that discussions are still ongoing about whether Canada will restore funding to a UN aid organization in Gaza. The organization is the main source of humanitarian assistance in the region, but several countries paused payments after Israel alleged some of the agency's workers participated in the October 7th Hamas attack. CTV's Judy Trin on the desperation. Thousands of food packages drop from the air, insufficient to stave off starvation. At least 10 children have died in recent days from malnutrition, according to the World Health Organization. The United States government is airdropping a tiny quantity of aid, including sweets for children, into Gaza, as if that is a solution to millions of people who don't have enough food and can't access food. Humanitarian groups says their trucks are being blockaded at the border crossings by Israel. We need land crossings, we need access to get it into Gaza, whether in the southern parts of the Gaza or the northern part of, part of Gaza, because the situation is catastrophic. Last week, more than 100 people were killed as crowds gathered around aid trucks. Israeli forces say they fired warning shots, while doctors say they fired at Palestinians. 
One day after the incident, the European Union restored its funding to UNRWA. It has recently decided to continue its funding of UNRWA uh, in spite of the allegations. Israel now claims that 450 UNRWA workers are linked to Hamas militants, but it hasn't provided evidence. As the UN investigates, more than a dozen countries, including Canada, have stopped donations. Last Saturday, angry protesters confronted Canada's International Development Minister over the suspension of funds. Canada's next contribution of $25 million is due in April. Ahmed Hussein hasn't said when funding will be restored. Human rights advocates are calling on Canada to push Israel to let in more aid by introducing sanctions. The government is also being sued in federal court to stop it from exporting military goods and technology to Israel. Omar. All right, Judy, thank you. Back here at home, food inflation isn't just being felt at the grocery store, but also restaurants. A 2% carbon fee was added to each bill at this Toronto pizza shop. The restaurant justified it by saying what we eat fuels climate change. Adding 2% to every restaurant bill to invest in carbon capture will help offset our carbon footprint. According to the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, as long as the restaurant doesn't call its carbon fee a tax, it's completely legal. And there is late word tonight that the five Canadians killed in the Nashville plane crash yesterday have been identified. A couple and their three children from north of Toronto. Coming up in a league of her own. A lot of people grow old before their time. Holding court with some age-defying shots. Plus, what happened to the skier in Alberta after this stunt? Oh. A retired nurse and grandmother has big dreams and is sporting some serious game. Here's CTV's BC Bureau Chief Andrew Johnson on the power of determination and smashing barriers. It's still dark out when a BC senior arrives at the local rec centre to begin her transformation. Sort of like Superman getting out of the telephone booth. She's no longer a retired nurse named Shirley Simpson on this court. What she's dressed in, that like gets people's attention because when you see a grandma looking drippy. And sounding 24 instead of 84. I'm out here looking like Jalen Brown. I heat up real quick like a hibachi. I want to be shooting 80% from the charity stripe. This is WNBA Grandma. I just can't believe what how this has taken off. A shock to Shirley, but not her grandsons, who created the TikTok and Instagram series that has now put smiles on millions of faces. We knew it was a recipe that could work. They've also gotten the attention of the WNBA and hope someday soon grandma can bounce her ball into the league's court. The dream scenario, an invitation to sit courtside during a game. So to shake their hands and say, congrats, girls, you're doing a fantastic job and I'm so proud of you because um, they've come a long way. Simpson's also a big Toronto Raptors fan, but this story has less to do with basketball than one family's bond. I had been looking after my husband a lot and I, I was getting out of shape because he didn't do much moving. Shirley's husband, David, died last fall and the boys got busy. Getting her back in the gym, getting her in the weight room, getting her training. The two kids she helped raise now lifting her up. They just treat me like gold. I spend more time with her than, yeah, pretty much any of my other friends. And that is why this 84-year-old who lives with pain and has suffered loss is smiling. Family and being with kids and doing things with kids is, that's important. That to me is what makes life, is family. Then this game is already won. Andrew Johnson, CTV News, Kelowna, BC. What an inspiration. And here's another one still ahead saying farewell to Canada's first lady of jazz. Remembering a musical trailblazer. The white free to the east, to the east with a lark. Mm, to the west with the sea. And I searched all the eyes. 
a rare sighting to share with you tonight. A gray whale in the Atlantic Ocean where they have been extinct for two centuries. Scientists couldn't believe their eyes when they spotted the whale off Cape Cod because they're usually only found on the west coast. The theory is ice is melting in the northwest passage so the whale could have swam over from the Pacific. A teenage skier in Banff is lucky to walk away with just a few bruises from this stunt. The boy takes a huge jump, soaring through the air right into the chairlift. The ski resort is warning people to stay in bounds. The singer known as Canada's first lady of jazz has died. Eleanor Cullen's career began in the late 1930s and spanned nearly eight decades. In 1955, Collins became the first Canadian woman and first black Canadian entertainer to headline her own nationally broadcast TV series. She was appointed a member of the Order of Canada in 2014 and honored on a postage stamp in 2022. Collins was 104. After the break, a leap year miracle. Four of a kind equals a full house for a Saskatchewan family. A northern Saskatchewan family is about to mark week one with their new expanded family, quadruplets born on Leap Day. Here's CTV's Allison Bamford. She opened her eyes for us the other day. Gilbert Morasti is no stranger to parenting, but raising four okay. newborns at once is a unique challenge. I still don't know how to express it. It's, it's crazy. Quadruplets Aaliyah, Beautiful, Cecilia and Dominic, born on February 29th, two months premature, only weighing around two pounds each. I just come from there, from the NICU, and the babies are doing just fine. Tiny but tough, and already defying the odds. The quadruplets join about 25,000 other Canadians born on Leap Day, just a fraction of the entire population. I'm so happy and grateful, feeling blessed. Both a blessing and a handful for the parents who have five other kids between the ages of four and 18. Mind-blowing that we just had four babies come into the family. I didn't really know what to think. All I could think about is, holy, my dad's in prayer, really busy, <laughs> really busy time with them. An exciting adjustment the siblings are trying to wrap their heads around. That's crazy. Like, one is enough, but like, four is weird. The babies will spend at least the next couple of months here in the neonatal intensive care unit, gaining strength before they join the rest of their family at home. I feel confident. But also at the same time, I know that we're going to need a lot more help this time around. Because Morasti says the focus will be making sure all nine of his kids get the attention they need. Allison Bamford, CTV News, Regina. And that's a snapshot for this Wednesday. For all of us at CTV National News, thank you for watching. Good night and see you tomorrow.